So we'll go ahead and get started here. It's wonderful to see you all, at least your names, and welcome to our webinar today. Um, my name is Maria Monroe DeVita, and I'm an associate professor and trainer and consultant for the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, or MHTTC. Uh, welcome to today's webinar um, featuring Patricia Deegan, uh, what does lived experience really mean and why is it important? Um, we want to first start out with our land acknowledgement today, which is on your screen. And we ask for those engaging in this event to reflect on the lands on which we reside and acknowledge all the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous peoples we, who have been here since time immemorial. And there's a great resource there to also identify stewards of your land um, wherever you're joining us from. Next, just a brief note about the MHTTC network. Um, we are a network of nationwide um, organizations supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. Our network includes 10 regional centers, a National American Indian and Alaska Native Center, a Native Hispanic and Latino Center, and a network, network coordinating office. And there are also networks for addiction and prevention using the same structure. The MHTTC network supports resource development and dissemination training and technical assistance in workforce development for the mental health field. And then a little bit about our center, we cover the um, Health and Human Services Region 10, which includes Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And our goals are to accelerate the adoption and implementation of mental health related evidence based practices to heighten awareness, knowledge and skills of the workforce foster alliances and address training needs among diverse partners and ensure availability and delivery of free publicly available training and, and technical assistance. Um, each um, regional MHTTC has an area of focus. Our particular area of focus is evidence-based practices for serious mental health issues such as psychosis. However, we provide training on a variety of topics included, including integrated care, suicide prevention, diversity equity issues, school mental health, peer support, trauma-informed approaches, and others. At the MHTTC network, one of our goals is to utilize affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all the work we're involved in. We want to remain mindful of all the different perspectives that come up in these events, and we kindly ask everyone to communicate using language that is respectful, non-judgmental, -jud inclusive, and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, abilities, and experiences. So just a couple of housekeeping details before we switch over to our, our webinar and our featured presenter. All attendees today are muted and off camera. Uh, this event will be recorded and you'll have the option to use closed captioning. We'll share the video recording and slides and send instructions on how to obtain a certificate of attendance in a few weeks. I'll also post, if you haven't seen it yet, I'll post um, a link to the website where you can access the slides. Um, for today, um, we've got both the chat and the Q&A um, box, and so please use the chat if you're experiencing any technical issues, you can send it to our staff and we'll try to help you out in whatever way we can quickly, or if you just want to make a comment about something, I think that's a great place. Um, there may be times where Pat asks you, know, you all a question and she's just wanting to hear a response, so that's a great place to put it. But if you have a specific question that you would like for Pat to address, then you would put that in the QA box. It's, these are content questions. And that helps us to monitor and to kind of keep track of who's asked which questions and which ones have been answered. We'll do our best to answer all those questions today. Um, and just a quick note that um, your feedback is super helpful. We really take it, it very seriously, what you tell us about each of these presentations. Um, so please uh, fill out the evaluation at the end. We'll put, uh, put that in the chat and just um, note that our surveys have changed um, in the past year. So if you have any concerns, there was a place you had to put in a personal code at the very beginning. You can actually use whatever numbers and letters you wish there. So I know we've gotten some comments about that. Um, okay, and now the best part of today is to uh, introduce our featured presenter. I'm really pleased to introduce you to one of my favorite people, Dr. Patricia Deegan. 
Her mission is to help activate and empower mental health service users in their own recovery and to provide peer supporters and clinicians with the know-how to support people in their recovery journey. She is uniquely positioned to fulfill her vocation because she was diagnosed with schizophrenia as a teenager, went on to get her doctorate in clinical psychology, and today leads a company run by and for people in recovery. She is a thought leader in the field of mental health recovery, has numerous peer-reviewed publications, has held a number of academic appointments, and has carried a message of hope for recovery to audiences around the world. Please welcome our featured presenter, Dr. Pat Deegan. I will turn things over to you now, Pat. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm coming to you from Massachusetts. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, today. Uh, our topic for today is what does lived experience really mean and why is it important? And uh, But uh, before diving into that topic, I want to just say um, that I do believe you're out there. <laughs> I cannot see you. I am uh, here and I believe you're there. So on that note, it can be uh, sometimes challenging to speak to uh, the void, but um, I, I know you're there and, and engaged. So uh, welcome. Um, I want to just start like I always do and say and say thank you that that uh, I know many of you on, on our webinar today are folks who are involved and in directly working with um, individuals who've been diagnosed with mental health challenges and who um, sometimes um, are coming to services with complex um, uh, uh, needs and uh, and uh, and that it takes a lot of effort, a lot of work um, to uh, do the work that we do, whether it be on an ACT team or in direct services and behavioral health. And clearly not everybody is called uh, to this work. And frankly, um, there are easier ways to make a living. Um, I mean, and sometimes you even make better money like at the Amazon warehouse perhaps, um, and yet you choose to do the work. And it's important work. And it's work that is um, I value tremendously, as do the people who are receiving services. Um, and that um, there's something very special about you for, for uh, uh, engaging with this kind of calling, with this kind of vocation. Um, and that uh, you know anybody can work in behavioral health for three months or six months. But if we've lasted longer than that, something's up. And uh, usually what I find is that uh, those of us who choose these professions and who choose to do this work, who feel called to it, are people who in our own lives have gotten pretty knocked down at some point or multiple points. And maybe we even thought we couldn't get back up, but we did. And that we know on a firsthand basis, in fact, we have the lived experience, if you will, of what it means to kind of get sidelined, knocked down by life, get back up, and somehow um, be able to move forward. And I often say, I don't know what uh, your experience was. It could have been a, a growing up in an alcoholic home. It could have been, um, you know, uh, uh, a miscarriage or, or losing a loved one. Not sure what, what your passage was about, but that you've had a passage and come out the other end, uh, not restored to who you used to be, but rather uh, renewed and transformed in many ways. Because I think those of us that stick with this work stick with it because um, we are carrying hope. We're carrying hope because we know, because we've lived it, that it is possible to get back up and to rebirth a life uh, out of what sometimes seem to be ashes, right? And we know this, and that's the hope. That's the beautiful, beautiful gift that we carry. And no amount of salary can, can uh, equal the uh, willingness on our part to open our hearts and to bring to bring that hope um, into the lives of people who are experiencing some of the biggest challenges they've perhaps ever ever been through. And so I mean it when I say thank you. It really does matter that every single time we touch a human life, every time we're able to meet an individual on the common ground of our shared humanity, that's healing, right? All the work starts from that moment. Um, and so um, thank you for that. <clears throat> okay. Again, uh, our topic, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, 
what does lived experience really mean and why is it important? So I want to begin with a um, exercise. So remember back for a minute to when we were in school. When we were in school, we were taught there were how many senses? Okay, not too difficult a question. We were taught that there were five senses. There's sight, and there's sound, and there's hearing, and there's smell, and there is taste. Now, here's another question for you. Do these strawberries dipped in chocolate look delicious? And for those of us who are not allergic to strawberries, <laughs> who love strawberries dipped in chocolate, the answer is an unequivocal yes. These strawberries, they look delicious. But wait, how can strawberries look delicious? We look and see with our eyes, correct? We taste with our mouth. So we can't taste with our eyes, can we? Now I'm gonna argue that there is a world that we know prior to what we learn in science class. There's a world we know prior to, to learning in school that there are five distinct senses. In the life world, the life world, in the world as we live it, our senses usually are not separate and distinct. In fact, they work in an important kind of synergy. They work together seamlessly to help co-create our experience of the world. So, let's ask ourselves, what were the steps that we needed to take in order to get to the lived experience of strawberries dipped in chocolate? Well, the first step was that we had to be willing to suspend our belief in the model or idea that there are five distinct senses. And as we're gonna learn in this webinar, this willingness to suspend a belief, not to eradicate the belief, but just to suspend it, to put it on a shelf, is called bracketing, right? And we started by bracketing this sensory model of the world. And we put that model of five senses on a shelf. The second step that we took, right, uh, was to reflect on the experience of being in the presence of an image of strawberries dipped in chocolate. We reflect on that experience as we live it, not as we think about it, but as we live it, even if what we find is different than what our models of reality would have us believe. And we learned something interesting. That is, we learned that at the level of the lived experience, our senses are not separate and distinct. In our lived experience, as we move through the life world, our senses often overlap. And this little exercise, as silly as it might seem, teaches us a lot. It teaches us an important lesson about where this phrase lived experience came from, what it means, and what, are the, and, and what the steps are that we need to take in order to discover this thing we're calling lived experience. So in part one of today's webinar, we're gonna ask what does lived experience really mean? And I promise you the webinar is not only about strawberries dipped in chocolate. The webinar is of course about lived experience. Um, in part two, we're gonna discover why this phrase uh, and this concept is important, but we're gonna start with lived experience. So. Uh, to begin with, in modern times, the term, the use of the term lived experience really has exploded, and we're hearing it all the time these days. In fact, here's a Google Ngram viewer, okay? And what I've done here is to grab the use of the term lived experience as, they have as the phrase has appeared in English, uh, in, in uh, books, in digitized books, between 1800 and 2019. And I want you to notice how the phrase lived experience actually enters into the English language in the 1800s, okay? By the 1920s, 
the use of the phrase lived experience begins to wobble and, and sort of to rise. But by the 1950s and 60s, the phrase lived experience really begins to take off. And of course, today in, in our Western culture, lived experience has become, as I mentioned, a very popular phrase, and we're hearing it all the time. Just to give you a sample, um, for instance, uh, we hear um, the idea of lived experience of uh, the city, uh, the lived experience of climate change, the lived experience of LGBTQ uh, individuals. Uh, we have uh, social critics talking about to us about uh, the limits of lived experience in the in the New York Times. Uh, in other publications, we hear about the tyranny of lived experience and how the woke elites are gaslighting the entire population based on lived experience. And finally, uh, all of us are definitely going to get a little concerned when politicians are suddenly beginning uh, to talk about their lived experience, right? And amidst all of this talk, uh, uh, sometimes I find myself wondering, and perhaps you do too, um, has lived experience, is it just a code that means you're a former mental patient? Does it just mean you've been diagnosed and used mental health services and I can say to you, hey, I got lived experience. You got lived experience? I got lived experience, right? Does it mean that? Um, isn't lived experience kind of the same as personal experience? <laughs> like, what is the difference? Um, if your lived experience, your lived experience contradicts my lived experience, who's right? Hmm, good question. Um, I've thought, hey, this job description says people with lived experience are encouraged to apply. Well, doesn't that mean everyone can apply? Because isn't it true that everyone has lived experience, right? Is it possible to have an experience that is not lived? Think about it. Very interesting. Doesn't, doesn't that make the idea of the phrase redundant, lived experience? What experience is not lived? <laughs> Why not just say personal experience? Why not just say subjective experience? And one that's been bugging me lately, what the heck is lived and living experience? Or as I heard it referred to the other day, LLE, lived and living experience. What the heck is that? Well, in order to get to the origins of the phrase lived experience, we've got to dig down into philosophy for a moment. So please hang in with me as I, as I do this. And when we start digging in, we will discover the work of Edmund Husserl. Now, Husserl was a German philosopher who lived between 1859 and 1938, as you can see here, so, so pre-World War II era. And as you look at the dates of his um, lifespan, of Husserl's lifespan, remember that engram that we studied a bit earlier. Husserl's life overlaps with the earlier decades shown on the engram. And that's because it was Husserl who coined the term uh, or the phrase lived experience. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. Now Husserl, in terms of philosophy, is considered the founder of phenomenology. And phenomenology is a school of philosophy, and it's also a movement within the history of philosophy. And phenomenology, it concerns itself with studying, describing, and understanding conscious experience from the first person point of view. So let's use an uh, example again to better understand the gist of Husserl's phenomenology. So we all know about time, correct? Time is based on the rotation of our planet around the sun, but routinely we measure time in increments on the clock, of course. And this is very basic and we all know it and we've all been trained on how to read clocks and how to apply them to, to our daily life. And in this model of time, a minute of time is a minute of time and it can be objectively measured. This way of knowing, I'm gonna say it again, this way of knowing about time 
is what Husserl calls the natural attitude. It's really a, a model about the world. And it's usually is accepted by us Westerners of, as what is really real. Fine. But Husserl was interested in this question. What happens if we bracket our models? What happens if we bracket our model of time? What happens, uh, this idea of bracketing, me? it really means to suspend our belief in the model that we have for a moment. Just, just put it on a shelf for a little bit. We don't have to debate it, anything. We're just going to put it on a shelf, right? And then we're going to turn our attention to our experience, right? Our lived experience of time. Not what we think time is about, but how we, when we're not even thinking about it, experience time. What is our lived experience of time? Well, if we bracket our model of time and explore our experience of time as we live it, I think we can all relate to this kid. We have all had the experience of a minute of time dragging on for an eternity. So just think about being in school and looking at that clock, waiting for an eternity for that one minute click to happen when finally we can go out to recess. And when it comes to the lived experience of time, sometimes time can drag on for an eternity. And if we bracket our model of time and focus on the lived experience of it, we also have to acknowledge that sometimes a minute of time actually flies by. Sometimes the minutes of time flies by so fast, like when we're on school vacation, we wonder where the time went. Well, my friends, this is lived time. The lived experience of vacation time is that sometimes time flies. So to pull it together, Husserl helped us understand that if we bracket our models, then a whole new world is revealed to us. And he called this world the Lebenswelt, the life world. In German, the life world, right? The world as we live it. And in phenomenology, that school of philosophy, we attempt to bracket or suspend our belief in models of the world in order to better understand phenomena like time as it's lived by human beings. So this is where the phrase lived experience comes from. Lived experience comes from Husserl's phenomenological method that involves bracketing our models so we can study and understand human experience from the first person perspective. And it's important to understand uh, that phenomenology did not start and end with Husserl. In fact, uh, following Husserl, we had the emergence of another generation of philosophers who rose to prominence in the post-World War II era. And this new group have come to be known as existential phenomenologists and included people like Martin Heidegger, uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Simone de Beauvoir. Now these great philosophers added to Husserl's phenomenology and advanced the idea of lived experience um, as an embodied way of knowing the world. Okay. Now, interestingly, in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, Simone de Beauvoir wrote a very, uh, who, as you remember, as an existential phenomenologist, also wrote a very influential book called The Second Sex that was published in 1949 and uh, brought this phrase lived experience into the feminist movement. Interesting. And this, I think, is very important to for our purposes here today uh, because it marked a kind of confluence, a merging, okay, of the idea of the phrase of lived experience with a movement for social justice. So there was a convergence and a confluence between the idea of lived experience and um, greater movements for social justice, uh, as we see uh, even happening today. But uh, it was Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, and the linking of lived experience to women 
uh, understanding um, their lived experience uh, and their narrative coming from that, um, that uh, became a very um, revolutionary uh, in terms of uh, how women, how we understand ourselves and our place uh, in the social world. So it's not surprising then that after this new wave of um, uh, philosophers and this convergence with feminism and other movements for social justice, it's not surprising that the, the, the rise of Husserl's phenomenology and this new, uh, new wave of existentialism uh, uh, occurred. Um, so the lived experience, as you can see, really began to take off uh, during uh, that period of, of time. And uh, then along came Pat Deegan, <laughs> okay? And I am not putting myself on the stage with what's rolling, et cetera. However, in the um, late 70s and early 80s, a very long-haired uh, person named Pat Deegan um, started hearing about this thing called psychology as a human science. Psychology as a human science. And it was taught at this place called Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, I was fascinated because basically the idea was if you wanna understand human beings, you, we can't study being human like we study uh, molecules in an atom, right? Natural scientific methods don't say all there is to say about being human. And so I became intrigued with this idea of what would it mean to study human being on human terms with a human science, you know, to study people as they're living, to study people in their lived experience as opposed to our models, right? So I became fascinated and ended up uh, getting accepted um, and uh, did both my master's and my doctorate in clinical psychology. Uh, and the emphasis was on um, uh, psychology as uh, a human science. And when I was there, uh, let me just give you the gist of the kind of thing uh, that I, I was learning. Um, I learned about how science can teach us about how the heart is a biomechanical pump. And natural science studies this anatomical heart and understands it from the perspective of a biomechanical model. Um, and um, this is one way of knowing the heart. Uh, but is this heart a human heart? Is it really the human heart really a pump? <clears throat> I learned in graduate school to ask the question, what is the heart that we know before science tells us that the heart is a pump? What is the heart we know before this? And of course, what I've done here is grabbed a photo of a, a Romeo and Juliet from a film. Um, and I was taught the importance and I desperately wanted to understand the importance of, of this heart, of the heart that can grow cold, of the heart that can leap with joy, of the heart that can break wide open. Um, I wanted to know the heart uh, that can grow hard of heart and calloused, uh, the human heart, the heart we live uh, before uh, we know the heart is a biomechanical pump. And what I also learned when I was at uh, Duquesne was uh, the importance of, of being willing to say that these are two ways of knowing. They don't always contradict each other, but often they uh, reveal very different kinds of knowledge. There are two, two ways of knowing, and one way of knowing is not more real than another way of knowing. A way of knowing allows us access to important information that we can use for a purpose. Now, if I have, um, I don't know, a blockage in um, uh, my heart, in, my, in a blood vessel, right? I do not want Romeo and Juliet or an existential phenomenologist doing a heart surgery, bypass surgery on me, thank you. It's totally 
uh, creates a lot of empowered know-how to treat the heart as a biomechanical pump and we can just bypass the, the, uh, the uh, blockage and get you back up on your feet, Pat Vegan. Yes, please, right now, <laughs> right? Right? I do not want someone with a lived experience of heartbreak doing my, my I, wa I want someone trained in the idea that the heart is a pump, right? And so there is utility. There is, uh, in, in these ways of knowing, they open up a world for us to see and to increase our understanding of what it means to be human. Um, and then we can use that knowledge in all sorts of different ways, right? And some ways are more effective in understanding certain issues than others, right? But it's really not a competition. And we're gonna come back to this over and over and over again, because I think there is a tendency out there to say, well, you know, lived experience is the, the truth. I call it big T truth, the truth with a big T. No, it's a small T truth. It's a way of knowing, but there are also can be other ways of knowing, right? Um, and so um, there I was, and I was learning all this amazing stuff about the lived experience. And what I ended up doing in my dissertation, I was very interested in the question of, um, you know, antipsychotic medications, because of course I had experienced being on those and everybody was telling me that it was so great to be important for me to be in on an antipsychotic medication after being diagnosed with schizophrenia because if you take the antipsychotic medication, it will bring you back to normal. And my experience was, oh no. <laughs> uh, antipsychotics meds did not return me to normal. In fact, it set up a third state that I call being medicated, me on medicine, me on medicine, right? I was able to reflect phenomenologically on that, but I was also pragmatic and wanted to get out of graduate school. And so I did not take on antipsychotics. I took on benzodiazepines, though. And I, so I did an existential phenomenological investigation of being tranquilized on a benzodiazepine. And, you know, you might say, well, what the heck does that mean? Well, what it means is I was interested in the lived experience of being tranquilized. What is it like to be tranquilized? And what I found through my studies, and in this case, it was being tranquilized on the diazepam, uh, Valium. And what I discovered was that when a person, when I would talk to people about their lived experience of being and becoming tranquilized, what I discovered was people would feel very, very anxious and get more and more anxious. And then finally, they make the decision to use diazepam to use the Valium and people go and relax, <laughs> take the medicine and then relax further. But there was this really interesting dynamic, just the act of deciding to use the medicine and believing or having the experience that it helps me. Already people began to relax all by themselves before the med could possibly have an effect. <laughs> and then, um, and then that was, um, so, so anyway, it was fascinating to me to find out what this lived experience of being tranquilized and how it all worked. And that's what I ended up writing about. And so I did get out pretty early. I think I, got, I did get out. And the first paper that I wrote um, was called Recovery, the Lived Experience of Rehabilitation. And this was published in 1988. And um, uh, in it, I wrote, it's important to understand that we don't get rehabilitated in the sense that cars get tuned up or televisions get repaired. Recovery refers to the lived or real life experience of people as we accept and overcome the challenge of psychiatric disability. So in this paper, um, it was uh, really interesting because I was bringing, this was published in um, the Psychiatric Rehabilitation Journal. Um, and of course, at this time, uh, Bill Anthony and others uh, out of Boston University were running uh, the journal. And uh, uh, what, I, what I was saying in this paper is, hey, um, basically, I was saying, you know, rehabilitation are these things that get that, that, that people outside of us can can do. They can, for instance, help us set a goal. Um, they can, for instance, help us get ready to go uh, to work. Um, but something else is happening on the other side of the equation. We're here, those of us with the diagnosis, and we're up to something too. 
right? And we're never going to understand what's really going on in this idea of recovery until we ask people, talk to people, and better understand this process, this lived experience of um, getting to the life that we want. That we had to learn about that too. And that the only people who could tell us about that were us, those of us with the diagnosis. So yes, psychiatric rehabilitation can tell us a lot, but we will never understand recovery until we're also talking to the people who have that particular lived uh, experience. Now, again, what's interesting is there was a particular kind of confluence, a convergence, a very important convergence going on here. And I'm acknowledging Darby Penny's uh, great slide here uh, from 2018. Um, and Darby um, helped me understand that it was around the same point in time, 1986, that we have the first consumer um, case manager aid program, as it was called at the time, in Colorado, uh, leading then to uh, the National Institute of Mental Health peer specialist uh, on um, intensive case management teams in New York in 1990. And then the, uh, New York being the first state with peer specialist civil service jobs. And then, of course, Larry Fricks in Georgia and the gang in Georgia uh, getting uh, the first Medicaid waiver. And so what happened? You know, what, what happened is that peer support started taking off uh, and disrupting the, uh, the workforce and behavioral health and enhancing the, wor the workforce and behavioral health. Um, and so um, this convergence with lived experience becomes very important. It was almost like adding this incredible person power, fuel uh, to this idea of the lived experience of recovery, right? Because now we had an entire workforce who were saying, hey, guess what? Hey, guess what? Um, there's paid peer support, there's recovery, there's our lived experience, and we are experts by virtue of our experience, right? We are experts by experience. And that's why I think we see that rapid, rapid um, adoption of the phrase lived experience um, in behavioral health um, uh, rising up out of the 60s, um, as I showed you on the engram, and then really taking off. So I think that this is some interesting background on the uh, where the phrase lived experience comes from. Right. And also, um, uh, you know, how it accelerated to such an extent in the um, 60s, 50s, 60s and, and onwards. OK, so in part two of the webinar uh, today, what I want to to focus on is why is this idea of lived ex experience even important? Um, and we're going to discover uh, three reasons uh, that I'm going to propose to you um, uh, why lived experience is important. So the first reason, as I reflect on it, um, is that uh, lived experience uh, is important because it guides the work of peer specialists. Very important in this sense. Um, so peer specialists bracket, again, suspend belief in clinical terms and models. And we listen to peers' lived experience, as well as their evolving understanding of what's happening in their lives. That's what makes us really unique in the workforce, right? Is a willingness to bracket clinical models, scientific models, mental illness is a disease model, we bracket those. And we are open to listening to our peers' lived experience and how they are making meaning uh, of that experience. Now, let me give you an example of how this is important in guiding the work of peer specialists. So a clinical model or a clinical way of knowing uh, sounds like this. This is a, a, a comes from a, a team. LM is a black cisgender female in her early 20s who began working with the team in March of 2022. She's bright, motivated, and engaged with the team. She's been experiencing auditory hallucinations prior to working with us. She's currently in college, but unable to complete the semester because she's failing her coursework. 
Her hallucinations are preventing her from being productive at school. She recently started responding inappropriately, laughing and smiling, to internal stimuli. She presents as distraught and often cries out of frustration with the voices. In March, she was prescribed olanzapine, which seemed to help decrease the intensity of the voices. However, for the past two weeks, LM has refused to take meds, stating they are unhealthy for her, and the team is concerned that she lacks insight into her illness and the need for medications, right? Now, this is, if you will, one way of knowing. You can see it in, in, in the way that these words formulate or come to understand what is going on with LM. Now, it just so happens that there is a peer specialist working on this clinical team. Okay, we can say it's an ACT team, for instance, right? And it's a peer specialist working on this ACT team. And the peer specialist was in the meeting where that description was presented. And during the discussion, the peer specialist said, well, LM is home now, and I could reach out to her sister to see if she would be willing to supervise LM's med compliance. Well, if lived experience guides the work of peer specialists, this is an example of drift. This peer specialist has drifted from the role of peer worker. This peer specialist forgot or did not know how to or was not trained to bracket clinical models and attend to LM's lived experience and her evolving understanding of the meaning that these experiences have, okay? When I say that um, this peer specialist did not bracket the clinical models, what I'm saying is that this peer specialist did not, at least for a few moments, suspend his belief in clinical models and words like hallucination, okay? And instead, he just adopted this idea, for instance, of medication compliance, okay? That's a clinical model. That's a clinical worldview. It's useful. It can be useful, but it's not what peer specialists do. So how could uh, things change here? Well, I think that following the idea of the phenomenological method being willing to bracket, to suspend our belief in clinical models, what happens is that we end up arriving at a more complex narrative that reflects LM's actual lived experience. And our job is to bring that forward to the team. That's the gift that we bring. And so he ends up getting back on track and he's able to use lived experience to guide his work and say, well, some of the voices LM hears are really wonderful. They comfort her and help her believe she's really special. LM chooses not to take the meds because they interfere with those good voices. She doesn't want to get rid of them. Whoa. The team struggles to access that kind of information because they're working from a clinical model, a medical model, clinical model worldview. Okay? The peer specialist is a vital and unique member of the team precisely because the peer specialist is guided. I lived experience. And that's why, my friends, here specialists, we don't use clinical language. We don't talk about decompensating or people returning to baseline. And we never say that somebody lacks insight, ever. That's not what we do. You know, what we say uh, 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 is we strive and allow lived experience to guide us in understanding the individual's lived experience and evolving understanding of that experience. That's what we do, right? We don't assess our peers. We don't encourage or discourage compliance. That's not what we do. Compliance is a term that we bracket. We suspend. We want to understand lived experience of feeling challenged by using medicine. We don't attribute motive to peers. We don't say, oh, she's attention seeking. She's sabotaging the job. 
These are clinical phrases you'll hear all the time in a treatment planning meeting, but we're not going to hear these terms from peer specialists. It's not what we do. Okay. And once we start using these words, once we forget to suspend these ideas and go to lived experience, we've lost what it is peer specialists do. The team misses out. Okay. We have a lot to offer. Let's do another one. Keanu told his peer supporter stories about shamans go way back in my culture. Maybe my visions and voices mean I'm becoming a shaman. Maybe I don't have psychosis. The peer supporter says, man, your doc says you have psychosis. It's not your fault. In order to recover, you have to accept your illness. That's the first step. This is drift, okay? What's happened in this scenario is um, that the peer supporter has forgotten to bracket the idea of mental illness, <laughs> okay? And instead um, has reinforced the idea of mental illness, which is the clinical worldview. It's not wrong. It's not bad or evil. It's not a big lie. You know, It's one way of knowing, just like that heart is a biomechanical pump, is a way of knowing that empowers us to do certain things. It's not the way of knowing we use as peer specialists. The way of knowing that we use as peer specialists is we want to be present to the lived experience of the individual and their evolving understanding, their evolving sense of what that experience means to me in my life now. So again, once we make that bracket, once we suspend our belief in, okay, insight into mental illness, then interesting things happen. And the peer specialist said, hey, that's interesting. I don't know that much about shamans. Maybe you can teach me. In the early days, I remember thinking I was having a spiritual emergence, like I was awakening into a new consciousness. It was beautiful. Well, this is a much more complex, in many respects, much more nuanced experience that is also true. <laughs> And that's what we embrace. That's what we, if we're peer specialists working on a clinical team, this is what we bring to the team, okay? This is what we can bring. So I want to argue that the unique contribution of peer specialists on clinical teams is always to help deepen the clinical narrative, to complexify the clinical narrative into a story of a resilient human being. Peer specialists are necessary, I would argue, on clinical teams because they help the team understand how the individual is making sense of their lived experiences. And peer specialists are guided by lived experience and not by uh, clinical models. And that, my friends, is what makes our work incredibly unique, incredibly important and unique. Okay, my second thought when it comes to why is lived experience important? Well, lived experience, in my opinion, is important because it's a source of wisdom that can actually be very helpful to other people. And that sometimes this wisdom of lived experience complements clinical knowledge. And sometimes the wisdom of lived experience challenges uh, clinical models and invites uh, the clinical worldview to grow, to change, to evolve, right? Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be a battle with a winner and a loser. The really real truth is X or Y. No, the lived experience is real. No, it's not about that. It's that each way of knowing empowers us to do certain things that can be helpful or less helpful. And sometimes bringing the two together works and, and enriches both, um, or at least it enriches one. And sometimes it's challenging, right? Which is good. It's about growing pains, I think, a lot for, for the clinical model. Okay. So let me give you some examples of what, what I'm talking about here. This is a, a, a person named Julissa who's being worked with by a team. And the team says that Julissa has auditory hallucinations. Um, but, um, and, and I should say from the clinical point of view, 
Voices are a symptom of underlying mental disorder, for sure. But what's happening uh, in the last uh, 30 or 40 years is that uh, people with lived experience are coming together. And as we come together, we're sharing our lived experiences. And what we're finding is that uh, when we talk to one another about the commonalities in our lived experience, we begin to discover that, well, wait a minute, hearing voices is a lot more common than we're led to believe and is actually a common human experience. So we see the wisdom of lived experience and us getting together, people with lived experience and sharing with one another and developing a new source of knowledge, which can actually be incredibly helpful to people who experience distressing voices in particular, right? Uh, so the Hearing Voices Network is a great example of that. Let's look at another example. You know, in, in everyday models, in clinical models, scientific models, medicine is a pill that you have to take every day as directed, right? But back in the 90s, I wanted to talk to people who've been diagnosed with serious mental illness and study how they actually use um, psychiatric medications in the everyday. And I met, I, I, I worked at the time, I uh, did, did this particular study in the great state of Kansas, and I met Joe outside of Wichita on a range uh, in, a, in a nice farmhouse at the kitchen table, we talked. And Joe said to me, uh, Joe has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, been living with bipolar disorder for a long time, and uh, had received mental health services and was still involved in services. We were talking about meds and quote, mood stabilizing meds and all that and his experience. And then he says to me, you know, Pat, I think there's a lot of other things that's medication that's maybe not considered medications. He said, there's things that you can do that does change what your body does. And it may not be medicine. I think one of the best mood stabilizers there is in life maybe not for everyone, but for me, is man. It was like amazing to hear him, right? So what he was saying is that, in effect, in his lived experience, math was a mood stabilizer. Now, for some of us, math would put us right over the edge. It definitely is not going to stabilize my mood. <laughs> However, for Joe, who was gifted with mathematics, when he would begin to experience the early stages of not being able to sleep and what clinically gets called hypomania, um, Joe would sit down at the kitchen table. And yes, he had a PRN for Seroquel that he would use in order to help him sleep. And he had worked that out with his psychiatrist. And he knew when to use that PRN. Okay. But what no one talked to Joe about was this other thing that he did. Okay. He sat down at the kitchen table and he worked out classical, complex mathematical problems at his kitchen table. And what he found is that um, mathematics and solving these math problems was a mood stabilizer for him. And I said, Joe, how does, how does that work for you? Like, how does that work? And he shared with me more about that lived experience. And he said, well, when I'm able to complete these, um, you know, classic mathematical problems, he said, it, it raises my self-esteem. And I know when I'm doing this, that I'm in charge, that I have mastery, that I have control, um, that I'm in charge of my mind, that I have a good mind, right? And that he said to me, and all of these, this was proof that I didn't have to let mania sweep into my life like an out of control train and, and take me off to parts unknown. That I'm capable, that I can manage. What powerful medicine. I said, yes. And um, huge. And over the years, you know, I, I published about this and, 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 and called this what I, what I like to call personal medicines. Personal medicines um, is what I do, not what I take. Laughter and love and exercise, they all change our biochemistry, right? Not just a pill, right? And for many of us, we find the pathway into the life that we want to live is by finding the right balance between, for instance, a psych med and our personal medicines, the things that I can do 
But in order to find our personal medicine, we have to find that healer within. Today, we have an international community of certified personal medicine coaches. So this is another example of what um, lived experience, Joe's lived experience, the, the lived experience of all those folks I was interviewing in Kansas have been organized now into a body of wisdom that we're now bringing out to the whole world. So lived experience, the wisdom of lived experience. Here's another example. Clinical presentation, Joel's suicidal. And suicidal behavior in the clinical point of view um, is a symptom of an underlying mental disorder. When people who've had the experience of wanting to um, end their lives, when they, when they come together, uh, for instance, in the alternatives to suicide uh, trainings and, and support groups, what we find is that there are many reasons, many, many reasons, not just reasons because it's a symptom of an underlying mental illness, that people say they're suicidal or that they actually begin thinking of killing themselves, right? So again, another example, this from Wildfire uh, Flower Alliance, Western Massachusetts and the alternatives to suicide movement. I mean, how cool is this? Are you seeing a trend? I'm definitely seeing a trend, right? Can you feel the wave? Can you feel the momentum? In other words, our lived experience, particularly when we begin sharing it with one another and organizing it becomes a body of knowledge, okay? That can be really helpful, really, really helpful. Another example, we all know the model of medication and uh, compliance. A person is non-compliant or they're compliant, um, adherent or non-adherent, very binary, like a, like a light switch. That's the clinical model. And if a person is not uh, compliant, it may be that they lack insight uh, into the illness, which is seen as another sign of illness, right? Then along comes Pat Deegan and Associates, and we're like, well, wait a minute. The lived experience is not of one of uh, the lived experience of adherence, not really. The lived experience is trying to use medicine to help me get the life I want. And that's a long journey. That's a journey. And there are a lot of challenges on that journey. And what would happen if we supported people through those challenges? Get a whole new way of thinking about and understanding the journey to use meds optimally, optimally to help me get the life that I want. Powerful new model. And even recently in a 2022 publication, I came across a, a nice article here um, of the lived experience of psychosis. And, and, the, and the authors, this is out of the UK, um, uh, did what they call a bottom-up review co-written uh, by experts, um, by experience and academics. So here we see sort of the convergence, if you will, of the more traditional way of knowing, academic knowing, right? And qualitative researchers coming together with a large group of um, individuals, experts by experience. And instead of starting from the top and saying, this is what psychosis is, how do you fit into it? They started from what they call the bottom. I would call it lived experience, right? They started from the wisdom of lived experience and allowed the understanding of psychosis to grow from that. It's a really, really beautiful way of working. It represents, uh, I think, an, an extension of a long history of qualitative study in, in the human sciences. So, so this is good news. Um, there's like a, a growing wave out there. Um, and uh, it's not the only way of knowing. <laughs> we don't have the last say or we don't have the big T truth. And I, and I can't say that often enough. But we do know something. And it's very valuable and can indeed truly be helpful when we can harness it. There's a third meaning to lived experience. And I think this is important because lived experience is another way of knowing. And sometimes lived experiences challenge dominant narratives that often ignore or dismiss the experience of historically marginalized people and communities, right? And so we see this happening more and more. But today, I think because of this lecture, we, we, can, we can tie that all the way back to Simone de Beauvoir and the migration from hospital of lived experience into um, movements for social justice. Um, and so that very often, um, there's a fancy word, that I, I think I've got it right, it's called hegemony. And it's really this idea of sort of the tyranny of a, of a, 
the dominance of a master narrative, right? The, the, the taken for granted, that, that natural attitude um, that, uh, you know, we, we impose. This is, this is what we know. The heart is a biomechanical pump. Time is an objective, measurable phenomena in the world, separate from me. You know, these, these kind of models, right? But too often those models leave out the lived experience, you know, the narrative, the story of people um, and uh, uh, who, who are traditionally um, kept out of that discourse, who are kept uh, marginalized and unable uh, to uh, directly communicate. Uh, and, uh, and I think we see increasingly in all kinds of movements for social justice, um, people um, uh, challenging dominant and dominating narratives um, that especially ones that ignore and dismiss uh, experiences of um, uh, marginalized, uh, historically marginalized uh, people and, and communities. And so um, I think that this is a, a really interesting development. Now, I want to open things up and have us think about, you know, my reflections, uh, comments, um, and, uh, you know, what struck you? Where am I off? What would you add? Because um, this is an important uh, discussion. It's really more of a, of a discussion than, than a lecture. And that's why I've left this time here at the end. We've got some time to chat. So love to, love to hear your thoughts and perspective and lived experience. <laughs> and lived experience. Well said. Thank you so much, Pat. That was wonderful. I, I know you, it's a, a busy time as a presenter. It's hard to even look at all the chat comments, but I hope you felt the love <laughs> and um, interest and support in just every, you know, you would say every few words and people would say, yes, this is, this resonates for us. So thank you very much. Um, we have a few questions in the Q&A box, so maybe I can start with those. And again, for anyone um, who has questions for Pat, we can just put them in there and we'll kind of work our way through and see how much time we have um, until the end of, um, we've got until about 1130 Pacific. So the first question um, comes from Rick DeLuga. Um, how can peers support clients who are court ordered to take medications? Thinking about this kind of sensitive issue that comes up often in mental health these days where there may be court orders or mm -hmm. mandates around treatment. What are your thoughts about a peer's role? Right. So clearly, you know, when, when a peer, I don't think it changes substantially from, from what I spoke about, right? So, so um, there's no doubt that being under coercion um, uh, can be uh, life-altering, can strain trust and make it difficult for people to trust us, even as peer specialists because we get seen as sometimes as part of the system too. And we are in as much as we're getting a paycheck. Uh, we are, um, that said, as peer specialists, I think we can be incredibly uh, important in validating um, sometimes people's experience of rage at being uh, involuntarily medicated. Uh, uh, the sense, uh, you know, I know from, from lived experience that the experience of forced medication um, uh, can can uh, be experienced as a type of rape. And that's a strong word, and I don't use it lightly, but, but it has historically been one of the ways that those of us in the MAD movement, that those of us in the expatient movement have talked about the violation, right? It's powerful. And um, uh, I think that uh, we, we can validate that. Um, we can um, also help people... Um, exercise what choices they do have around the issue of being medicated. Um, um, particularly if, if you, I have done, uh, you know, talk to people who have been through it and, you know, being able to know that you still have a voice and what you say still matters. Maybe a judge says you have to take the medicine, but you can still say, I don't like it. Um, and that that can be heard. Um, the, the, the role of the team, I don't think is to, to, to say, uh, the role of the individual, uh, I, I don't, I don't, uh, the peer specialist is, I don't think necessarily to trash the team or to say, yeah, the team set you up for this or, but we can hold, you know, just be there and be able to experience that with an individual um, and listen uh, to the outrage uh, of that. Um, of course, simple things like we don't go and deliver court orders and we don't deliver people to court, you know, when they're going to get a surprise. I, we, we don't 
participate in that. And I think teams need to be able to say, yeah, that's not the peer specialist job um, to, to, to do that, right? Or to bring in um, urines <laughs> to, uh, you know, to be um, screened for, for tox, stuff like that. That's not what we do. Thank you, Pat. That's super helpful. I, I think it's helpful to just kind of hear you expand upon like also not just this one question, but how it relates to a number of kind of adjacent topics. <laughs> so thank you for going into some of those other examples too. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question from Jennifer um, about, I, she says, um, I saw that you use the word accept as part of recovery in the quote from your article. In your opinion, is acceptance a necessary component for recovery? Yeah, I think, you know, 1988, I don't know how old I was at the time, but would I use that word today? Not so much, you know? So it's not my favorite word, nor, nor, nor the most favorite thing I ever wrote, but mm. I had a good idea there. <laughs> so more kind of getting past sort of the the word except from you know way back in the seminal article but more the content that was in that article and it seems like that's also consistent with what you said about um you know insight or not lack of insight or you know just that it's not yeah it's not about that yeah, yeah I don't think you have to accept that you have a mental illness in order to get to the life you want no I, I would not endorse that and I don't think I thought that at the time either. Right, right. More the word, the wording was just of of the era. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what about, um, so Jonathan has a question, um, given the reality of peer support specialists often being the minority amongst colleagues who are predominantly very clinical, what are some practical steps we can take day to day to maintain our, our authentic role and perspective? Yeah, you know, any practical things. Great there. question, because it is like, um, you know, culture can be like an undertow. And, you know, despite our best efforts, we can find ourselves kind of getting dragged uh, back under um, and sort of it can be hard to be alone. The only one who speaks in a slightly different way than the team. We want to be accepted. It's natural to have affinity and to want to adopt the words and outlook and sound intelligent like other team members do. Right. There are. And yet we can't. Um, or the team loses what it is that we do. So, so there are really specific things we, that we can do and that must be supported by leadership on the team. So for instance, we need to ensure that, um, that as a peer specialist during paid work hours, I have access to other peer specialists, whether that be other peer specialists in my state, within the organization at large, there needs to be time on payroll where I can meet um, and uh, sort of meet with other peer specialists, share experiences, get support. Um, another very, very critical thing is the ongoing um, education and um, development of my skill set as a peer specialist. So although I might sit in on a training for DBT, I'm not going to use it because that's not what I do. So if my team is training, I might learn so I know what these words mean, okay? but I'm not gonna use it. But, but I also need to make sure that I'm going to um, uh, personal medicine coach training. So I learn how that works. I need to go to um, you know, um, a hearing voices group so that I'm continuing to learn about the lived experience way of knowing and how to tap that wisdom and bring it to work with me. Um, so, 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 so having my organization pay for me to, for instance, go to a national alternatives conference, to go to a national association of peer specialist conference, to go to my statewide conference and network. All of these things become critical in maintaining my identity um, as a peer. Excellent. What about, um, <clears throat> so John, Jonathan brings up again, I, I read the book Surviving Schizophrenia by Dr. Tori, E. Fuller Tori. Um, if I remember correctly, he seemed to discourage the Hearing Voices Network. I'm mm -hmm. not suggesting he was right in this, but what are your thoughts about a psychiatrist um, that might discourage a peer from getting off medication to be able to hear their voices more clearly? I understand you did touch on this a little bit, but I'm curious to you opening the dialogue on this further. Can you read it one more time? Yeah. So basically, um, 
what are your thoughts about a psychiatrist that might discourage a peer from getting off medicine to be able to hear their voices more clearly? Oh, yeah, yeah. But there was also something about the Hearing Voices Network. Yeah, it was more just a comment about um, E. Fuller Torrey's book, Surviving Schizophrenia, how he, that they seem to remember um, that he was discouraging the Hearing Voices Network. Yeah. Well, I think I think that um, there can be um, distrust within institutional psychiatry, but also within institutional um, uh, behavioral health itself. Thinking that these ideas that can percolate up from lived experience and even sometimes get harnessed into a body of knowledge, like the Hearing Voices Network, like um, alternatives to suicide, like personal medicine, like medication empowerment, that these things are anti-psychiatry. And I would say, no, I, I, I'm not sure, you know, what anti-psychiatry uh, quite means because I know psychiatrists who, you know, uh, have um, values and practice that uh, goes across the spectrum. Some who work with no meds, some who use meds, but much more judiciously than others. So, um, so I do think that um, uh, some psychiatrists just have, a, a, or professionals in general, have a knee-jerk reaction to, to, uh, to the Hearing Voices Network and other types or other ways of knowing that that do are more representative of the lived experience. But let's remember, there's also the lived experience of having been, um, you know, wonderfully successful in my use of medications to support me in getting the life I want. There's a whole body of wisdom there. We just quite, haven't quite harnessed that yet. So, you know, I think, um, I think that, you know, if there was an individual psychiatrist that I was working with on a team who was um, hesitant about the hearing voice, referring someone to a hearing voices network, I'd be interested in why, what's going on, what are the fears? And I think, honestly, the fear is that it boils down to, it, they'll tell them to go off their meds. And number two, they'll um, tell them that it's not a mental illness, it's something else. And that years of effort on the part of the team will go down the tubes and the progress that's been made will be undone. And I think that's a little on the catastrophic side because it really doesn't give the individual in question here much in the, in the way of having their own point of view and their own ability to take in information, process it. So I think as a peer specialist, supporting people and getting to some of these lived experience groups, if you will, this, this lived wisdom is huge. When you meet other people who've gone through something that's like what you've gone through, it's like life-changing. <laughs> you know, it just changes people's lives. And uh, so I'm all for it. <laughs> I'm all yeah. for it. Yeah. Well, and I, I think this, you know, heaven forbid the idea that you go to a hearing voices, you know, meeting and, uh, you know, you, it normalizes your experience, heaven <laughs> forbid that, right? <laughs> and so then you lose insight into your illness or something like that. Like, I think sometimes there's this underlying fear that you're, you know, you no longer take it seriously that what's happening with, you know, your quote unquote illness, because it's now being normalized somewhere else versus, you know, that it's, it's important to, to know that other people are out there experiencing the same thing and that this could be really helpful for the person, you know? So it's like this idea that being on the medications is the right thing. Um, and ha having insight into it is the right thing. So, well, great, great question. Um, I think you pretty much hit this, but if there's anything else you wanted to expand on, um, a question about just anything else about peer drift and how we can just not get caught up in the clinical models and speech. I feel like you covered that pretty solidly. Anything else you'd want to add about that? Just that we should all be very aware of it. It is extremely prevalent. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, um, and it's a very serious issue because our numbers continue to increase across the country and around the world. And yet if we lose our vector, if we lose, um, you know, the, the uh, guideposts that help keep us in, in our work, um, there's going to be, then why not become a case manager, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think as, as a discipline, we really have to be, there are all kinds of ways that people are, are drifting. And sometimes it's because even our supervisors on the team 
ask us to do stuff that really is way outside the road. So it's not just a matter of educating ourselves as peer specialists. It's also a matter of educating the entire team as to what our role is. Um, and uh, that's pretty imperative. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What about, um, there's a question about just how can can peers um, and and working with those in the kind of more of a clinical role, how can they help to advocate um, with those people to see them as equal or um, that they're an expert in their own right or their own field as well? Well, I think that um, hearing I don't know. I, I think it's helpful to hear lectures like this where people can see, you know, what it is that it does mean something specific um, and to learn the skills of how to know when someone is drifting. Um, but I also think, and, and it's very important for us to remember that when peer specialists join the traditional workforce, and by that I mean the clinical workforce, um, even if there's just one of us on a team, we disrupt a clinical culture without intending to. We don't come in to do, to disrupt, we just do. Um, because just by being there, we overturn, you know, a hundred years of the chronicity, maintenance and stabilization model. And so we say, no, recovery is real and we can recover. <laughs> and that overturns literally a century of theory and study. And so talk about a disruptive innovation, just showing up at work creates a culture shift within the organization. And I have a whole other analysis I do of this but understanding the culture shift, it's not easy for clinicians when we come on board because somewhere in their mind, part of it, it creates a cognitive dissonance, okay? An uncomfortable feeling like, oh, I don't like this because I too was in therapy for 15 years <laughs> before I got my degree or whatever it might be. <laughs> Does that mean I'm a peer specialist? Really? Do I have lived experience? Really? You know what I'm saying? Uh, and it creates this disruption, this cognitive dissonance, right? And when cognitive dissonance happens, we just want to dismiss the irritant, <laughs> which is the peer specialist. Just make them make them like us, assimilate them, like the board, if you love Star Trek, like I do. <laughs> you know, just assimilate into clinical culture. Well, there you go. Now we've got a peer specialist who's not who's part of the board. <laughs> not mm -hmm. I, I really respect clinicians. I really do. But I'm just saying it's a dominant culture, right? <laughs> it, yes, it is for sure. So, yeah. so, so, so that these these culture shifts that occur when peer specialists enter the clinical workforce are predictable. There are things we can do to um, help uh, teams navigate the uh, challenges with making that shift um, and the transformation of culture to be inclusive of the peer worldview, lived experience, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and how it sometimes challenges clinical know-how and how at other times it um, uh, enhances and complements it. Mm -hmm. it. Makes us better clinicians by knowing the peer view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well said, yeah. Um, comment and question. It seems to me that it takes humility to be willing to bracket, um, uh, suspend my ideas, concepts, beliefs. How can we encourage that humility? Can it be taught? How, to, how can we foster humility? So to be willing to bracket because this idea of needing to be, to have that humility. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I like that word humility. Um, um, and, and, I, and I do think it, it requires, it, it requires us to be humble in the sense of admitting we don't know everything, that we don't have the big T truth, that we, none of us have the big answer, right? And that um, there are multiple ways of knowing, each of which can be helpful sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I think it's that willingness to be curious, that willingness to, to not kind of lock ourselves in. Then I think we're in entering stasis. Then I think we're stuck. Then we're not moving. Then we're not learning and growing. I think um, that we need to be willing to, to bracket um, and to enter into things that are unknown in the hopes of learning something magnificent and just fabulous. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so exciting. Mm 
Mm. What, what can be, what, what else can be learned? And then to noodle on what does it mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that becomes fascinating too. But it, I, I would agree. I, I like the idea of, of clinical um, humility. I like the idea of peer specialist humility too. Um, mm-hmm. Because that's the other thing I do see, and I, and I will say this is is like oh, peer knowledge is real knowledge. We've got we've got the real big T truth. Mm-hmm. Clinical knowledge is wrong. <laughs> well, no, it's not. In fact, it's it's really wise in some ways. It really can help sometimes, but not the only thing that can be helpful. So mm-hmm. that's that's the humility. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, we we can mature as a profession, as peer specialists, to to uh, to develop that humility. Great, thank you. Um, really good question here about: um, Can you speak to the pros and cons of peer certification? Um, there's a very vigorous debate around this topic in, in this person's jurisdiction. Um, no formal certification or inclusion in the Medicaid state plan. And the argument, again, seems to be at the heart of what um, you've spoken to so beautifully today, uh, maintaining the authenticity of the peer role. Um, let's see. So just question about that. Like, So does that make sense? It's sort of by putting it in the state plan or making it kind of official, it sounds like that's what they're saying. Um, it pulls away from it being a truly peer kind of role. Well, of course, there's the distinction, right? That that, uh, and I think Darby makes it really clear in that particular slide I shared, um, where the, you know there is this distinction, which is paid peer support. And uh, as paid peer support, I think it's inevitable that we're going to become a profession, but it'll never be the only story about peer support. I think peer support has happened uh, for centuries at the level of individuals in their communities, and that uh, nothing's ever going to stop that ever. But if we do want to become a paid profession, you know, um, that has its um, standards of practice that include um, an affirmation of uh, what we mean by lived experience and how it guides our work with our peers and et cetera, then then I think um, certification becomes important. And, and And I would really hate it if it became just totally tyrannical and and even worse, I would hate it if it was just all wrong. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would really, and and not that I have the big T truth either, but I hope we're the ones writing the standards <laughs> and not some other group somewhere. <laughs> yeah, having authorship over your own <laughs> role, <laughs> your own experience, yeah. your own profession. Yeah. Um, well, similarly, this is kind of, again, a, another policy related question. So um, this person feels called to advocate for the peer movement in the policy arena, but feels like it can be an uphill battle, like fighting an uphill battle um, and takes so many spoons. So is there any way to make the process less exhausting or maybe more efficient or effective? Anything you can can think that would be helpful for those advocating in the policy realm for the peer peer role, peer movement in their state or nationally. God love you, because I, I, that is what I do well, um, you know, um, and I think that uh, I'm not the person to speak to having the, the stamina um, to, to, to be wise in those ways, right? Um, other than what I know from, from any kind of work that can be taxing is that we have to continue to be able to reach into, um, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of that unquenchable fire like uh, Reverend King used to talk about that can't be extinguished by any hose, just that place within us where the passion lives and being willing to draw on it and keep our eyes on that prize um, and, uh, and know that, you know, we might not get there, <laughs> you know, but we can, you know, add to it um, incrementally and relying on each other. I mean, without our communities, we're nothing, right? We, we were already standing on the shoulders of giants, and I've mentioned um, Darby today, and and, and and of course there's Celia and so, so, so Celia Brown and so many others. Um, and we need uh, to rely on each other and prop each other up when things are getting rough, and always be mentoring that new generation of leadership that's coming up behind us. You know, and I think. Uh, 
it was Angela Davis who said, you know, bring bring someone along with you where, you know, someone who's coming up so that we're always feeding the ranks of advocates. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's a place for talking about lived experience if you were a peer that is now taking on a clinical role? Yeah, I do. Okay. I think it's very important to to be willing to to share. Um, and I and I, um, you know, there was a time I, when I one of the things I did when I wrote that eighty eight paper, I was also the clinical director for continuing care services for the Mid Cape region of the Office of Mental Health for the Department of Mental Health in um, Massachusetts. So I was working as a clinical director, you know, at the ripe old age of I don't know what twenty nine maybe, and. Uh, Boy, uh, that was that was tough. But for sure, what I did was part of the time is be willing to share with someone I might be working with, just you know, in a in therapy, working within therapy, whatever. Just a moment to to, to share that. Have you tried this? Or I found this worked for me. And yeah, their jaw would drop open. But you know what I'm saying? And it's not that I would you know give my whole history. You know the, that whole story. We don't we don't go there as clinicians. That's that's not how we're trained to practice. And yet at the same time, it's making it real, you know? And I think, I think lived experience, as long as we're open to the fact that someone else's lived experience can be completely different than ours. <laughs> and when I went, you know, I, I think it's, it's fine. It humanizes the process. Mm-hmm. Well, it reminds me of the other webinar you've done, which um, we also have on our website about boundaries. And, um, you know, just kind of how do you sort of gauge and have a framework for yourself around how you address, you know, how you kind of work within boundaries, what feels comfortable to you, what, you know, is could be clinically helpful, that kind of thing. It's, it seems to kind of have some overlap with some of that, too. Yeah. So there's a question about just if a peer um, goes into crisis, like what any guidance around you know, return to work, um, what what would be the best approach um, for someone? And I, I would imagine, you know, it's so individual, it's hard to have kind of a canned answer to that, but any thoughts for this person who just is concerned about if, you know, a peer goes into crisis and best approach for return to work and that and their role? Right. So again, I do a whole webinar on on supervision and supervising when, when, when clinicians are supervising someone in a peer specialist role. And I think we, it's very important not to replicate a clinical experience because both parties, both the clinician or the, the, the peer specialist supervisor as a clinician has their own experience of therapy and the clinical role. And, and, and so doesn't the peer specialist in as much as they've been in services. And it's, it, it can happen that the peer specialist supervisor falls into the therapist role and the peer falls into the patient role. Um, and we begin relating like that. So that that's a trap. Uh, and I just want to state that at the outset. We, you know, we don't want to go there. But I also think it's very imperative that we not, uh, you know, swing to the other side and kind of do the, um, we're, I treat everyone the same. It's not a good idea to treat the peer specialist exactly the same as other members of the team because the peer specialist is in a very unique place, particularly in as much as often a peer specialist is an N of one, just, just the one on the, on the clinical team. Um, and that can be a lonely space to be in. So I think that um, as peer specialists, we need to take responsibility for our disclosure um, to the rest of the team. We're under no um, compulsion to have to uh, reveal everything about ourselves, including whether or not we're using medications currently or or any or in other words, so so keeping our boundaries, our limits clear in our mind as clear as we can be is very, very important. Um, if we are experiencing a difficult time under the Americans with Disabilities Act, we can and do have the right to exercise um, uh, you know a request for a reasonable accommodation. Um, and that the onus is very much on us as individual peer specialists around that, right? That that we, it is not my supervisor's job. In fact, it's sort of illegal for my supervisor to come up to me and say, do you need a reasonable accommodation a few weeks off from work perhaps <laughs> you know, if I'm having a rough time on the job? No, that's on us. That's our self-care. That's what we do. 
So ask yourself, as part of your peer specialist onboarding and training in the agency, as well as in terms of getting certification, are you being trained in how to rigorously use the ADA um, to advocate uh, for what accommodations you may need if things, you know, if, if the waters get choppy or rough, right? So, so we want to we want to do that. I think um, as a as a clinical supervisor, we have to keep it within the job description. I'm noticing you can't say you seem to be you seem to be responding to internal stimuli. <laughs> we can't go there. That's a therapist. What we can do is say, I noticed that um, when you were talking to Joe in the waiting area the other day, Joe was talking about this and you were talking about that. What was that about? Help me understand. Because a big part of your job as a peer specialist, you know, is to be listening to Joe's lived experience, right? So, so we so make sure we have every right to make our observation, but we have to do it within the constraints of what the actual job is. What is the performance that seems to be being affected? That seems to be um, uh, uh, causing uh, or, or what, what job uh, performance? What is the job? What is the issue in terms of job performance? Is how we have to frame speaking with somebody, not some off the cup observation that we made that we made uh, clinically. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. I, and just so you know, too, um, we're, we included a, links to your past webinars and I know we've like run over time. So, wow. I appreciate that almost 300 oh. people still stayed on <laughs> holding on to your last word here, Bet. So thank you. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but hopefully some of your questions can also be answered by accessing some of those other webinars that we put in the chat. Um, will um, Peyton, can you put the, you probably put the evaluation link up there recently, but if you could just take a few minutes, maybe we could just keep the chat open for a bit um, just so people can access the link to the evaluation. Um, we really appreciate that. Pat, once again, it's always a pleasure. And thank you again for sharing this, you know, new content, but also um, after years and years of, of working in this field and, and your knowledge and expertise in this area, putting it all into one place for us, we really appreciate it. I can see people were very happy with, with what you had to share today. So thank you. All right. Thank you all. All Bye. right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.